Oh, good afternoon. My name is Dave Sparks. I'm a software engineer on the Google uh, Project Class. Um, I'm here to introduce Marty Brownstein, who uh, I've known for about 12 years now. I first met Marty when I was uh, managing an R&D center. Uh, they had some organizational issues. Marty's the founder of a company called Practical Solutions Group. He's written a number of books on uh, basically organizational effectiveness and runs a, a practice and training people. So Marty came in and helped me uh, say, uh, you know, reorganize the, the unit and basically help our productivity and things like that. So I was very surprised when Marty approached me, uh, uh, I guess it was about a year ago, and said he'd been working on a, a new project and it, it wasn't another uh, management book. Uh, by the way, he's written, I think, four or five? Seven. Seven management books. Uh, remember communicating for dummies and managing teams for dummies. Uh, coaching, and, yeah, mentoring. Coaching and mentoring for dummies. Um, so he's quite an accomplished author already. But I was rather surprised by uh, the book that he uh, decided he was going to write. Um, and it's basically a story of a Dutch couple in the, uh, during the World War II in occupied Netherlands uh, who you know, put their lives at risk for other people. Mm -hmm. So take it away, Marty. OK, thank you, Dave. Yeah, yeah applause, I, I, I definitely would appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Get ready to get involved in an amazing story that I'm going to take you through. And to start this journey into this remarkable story about two heroes, I want you to be thinking about these three questions. So question number one, would you be willing to help others whose lives are in great danger? So think about that. Question two, would you be willing to help others whose lives are in great danger knowing that if you get involved to help, you probably put your life in great danger, would you still help? And question three, would you be willing to help others whose lives are in great danger, knowing that if you get involved, you probably put your life in great danger, when these people who most need that help, most everybody else wants to either hate them or be indifferent to their plight, would you still get involved and help? Two Among the Righteous Few, a story of courage in the Holocaust, is a true story about a Christian couple who answered a definite yes to all three of those questions in a time period when most everybody else said no. And to give this book its just due, I should say its title is this, Enklin in Verhal von Mut in the Holocaust. That's the title of this book translated into Dutch. As you heard Dave mention, this story takes place in the Netherlands, commonly referred to as Holland, during World War II in the Holocaust. And this couple I'm referring to are a husband and wife named Franz and Mien Weinacher. They are true heroes of this story. Doing something in a climate of hate and indifference when most people wouldn't get involved, these ordinary folks will end up doing extraordinary things. And I'm going to take you into this story in just a moment. I'm going to be starting with you and we'll see what you know about the greater context of the history going on at this time period. Because when you understand that, it's going to make what they did even look more remarkable, because it was. I'll also take you into life in Holland during the war. Very difficult time period there. And then I'll be talking to you about who Franz and Mien Weinacher are, who they were, they're not alive today, and what they end up doing that is so heroic. And the last piece I'm going to talk to you about is I have a personal connection to the story. You see, as I pause for a moment here, this is a story that I stumbled into by accident a little over three years ago. As Dave was telling you, he knows me from very different things. This is not part of my normal work. It wasn't. It's become now a big part of my life. And the story I stumbled into by accident, not by design, has kind of developed over time. And we can talk about it when I open up the floor afterwards for your questions about the journey of this. So I'm very, very much appreciative when I get a chance to share this with an audience. And so I want to, let's first give a hand. I want to thank you, Dave, for helping make this happen for me today to come here. Since the book came out, which is just last fall, Today marks my 65th event in sharing this story with an audience of all sizes, all places. And we've often had, and I hope afterwards you come up and talk to us, and Books Inc. is here to help you if you want to buy a book as well, that we've had people come up and be supporters for us. And they've gotten us into their workplace or their church, synagogue, uh, my kid's school, they said. I've had some people came up and said, I'll host one in my home for you. So we've had a variety of that kind of support. Others just say, I'll sign up on your list and you have other events 
I'll help spread the word for you. If you can help in that way, most appreciated because this is what I keep getting told by audiences that keeps me going at this. You have a special story, people need to know it, keep telling it. So that's why I'm here. Well, let me take you into the story. And I'm gonna start with helping you understand the greater context of the history behind this story. So we're gonna see what you know here, quiz today. So question one, I said the story takes place during World War II in Europe. Well, when does the war in Europe start and then finally end? 39, Very good, it started in 1939, ends in 45, and in fact, let's even go more exact. When in 39 does it begin? Now, you don't lose any points by guessing. Yes, go ahead. Very good. We September 1st, 1939. Do you know the event that triggers the start? No, that's uh, before the war. That'll be in November of 38. Very good. Germany invades Poland. The powers to be, Britain and France in particular, declare war against Germany. Enough's enough, Adolf Hitler and what you're doing in Europe here. And the war will now begin. Interesting enough, by the way, just to help you remember this, if you go back to the movies, just a year past, 2010 Academy Award winning movie, The King's Speech. Who saw it? Hey, good, they go to movies here, good. Remember the culminating scene of the movie? King George is giving that major speech? What's he talking about in it? You were just worried whether he was gonna stutter or not, but what was he talking about? The date of that speech is September 3rd, 1939. That's the formal declaration by Britain. That's what he's talking about. We're declaring war against Germany. So in between the starting, he did pretty good that day. That's what's happening. So this is gonna become major. Because you said the war then ends in 45 in Europe. Oh, by the way, when in 45? You have 12 guesses here. <laughs> June, close, close. Ah, uh, yes, between you two. May, that's it, good, good. What's that, that game show you can play there? Yes, you're very close, yes. May 45, it finally ends in Europe. August 1945, it will then end in Japan. So this war in Europe, over five and a half years, almost six years in total. This war, World War II, not all that long ago when you think about it. A lot of you certainly may have relatives still alive who were there. This war, when it's finally over, still true today, is the most destructive war in humankind's history. Billions of dollars in property damage all over. 55 million people will be killed in this war, worldwide. And what we had never seen in wars prior, and we'd seen destructive things in wars before, more of that death will occur to civilians than soldiers. 30 million of those will be civilians. When you think about 25 million soldiers, it's just humongous. It's gonna even be worse for civilians. They're gonna be caught into this war. Nearly two thirds of this death and destruction will occur in Europe. There will not be a single country in Europe, and there's over 30 there, that will not be impacted adversely one way or another by this war. If you're living in Europe during this time period, your life will become a nightmare after September 1st, 1939. Franz and Mean Weinacher live in Europe. You don't want to be there. Now my next question, we look at the greater context of this. Is this also, this story takes place during the Holocaust, capital H, the event. Well, when does the Holocaust start and finally end? 32, close, very close. 1932 was close. She's only one year off. Big hint. Uh, the wrong way. So try again. 1933, we have a winner here. Yes, 1933 it begins in where? It begins in Germany. And it finally ends when? Uh, no, not quite. Still going on after that. 1945, actually May 1945, Dave was hitting it right, when the war finally ends, the Holocaust will end. These two events are separate events, but they're going to intersect. They'll be happening simultaneously. 12 years is the Holocaust. And it'll actually go in phases when you look back over time. The first phase just begins in Germany and towards the, that's all before the war. And then towards the end of the 30s, Austria. As Germany will annex Austria. And even towards the very end before the war, they'll annex Czechoslovakia. And the persecution and then violence will be happening in this first phase, especially targeting Jews. And then in the second phase becomes the conquering phase, as this will start to spread throughout Europe. And the final phase, and that goes for a couple years, and the final phase starts late 1941, known as the final solution, and that will be the mass murder phase. For the Holocaust, this systematic, nation-sponsored, racist effort to persecute, isolate, 
and mass murder all these people on Hitler's so-called list of undesirables. When it is finally over, 11 million people will be murdered through the Holocaust. That's more than how many live in the Bay Area. It's nearly a third of the population in the whole state of California. Top of that list of Hitler's so-called undesirables, Jews. But they're not the only ones on the list. But when it's finally over for Jews, six million there. There's six of the 11 million. That's nearly two out of every three European Jew who lived on that continent prior to this destruction happening. And if you're part of that group of 11 million, and you turn to any governments or country, who's going to help you? The answer is none. At best, you might find a few individuals who have the courage and compassion to do the right thing, but it was not going to be the norm. By the way, besides Jews is the top of the list, who was among those five million others? Gypsies. Very good. Gypsies, yes. Who else? Say again. Gypsies. Communists, definitely. Oh, Hitler hated them. Yeah, they were, top, they were near the top of the list. Homosexuals, yes. Handicapped. Jehovah Witnesses, some Poles, people of Slavic heritage, the list went on. He just got stopped before he could continue going on. That's the Holocaust. And if you're on that list, in most cases, people were not prepared and didn't know what was happening. It was often your life is doomed, not a nightmare, doomed. Now, my last major question, when you look at the greater context of this historical effort, let's go back into the war. And what's going on in the war at a point in time when the United States enters the war? When does the United States get into the war, by the way? Yes, 1941 and when in 41? Almost December 7th. Yes, December 8th, because of what happened on December 7th. What happened on December 7th? Pearl Harbor. Japan attacks the United States, a major naval base. The next day, President Franklin Roosevelt declares war against Japan with Congress approval. Well, Japan is part of the Axis powers with Germany and Italy. And those two countries in Europe turn around and go, all right, we're declaring war against you too, United States and vice versa, and the United States is finally going to get into the war here, worldwide, including Europe. So we take you late 1941, back into Europe. What is the situation of the war at this time? What do you think? What's happened? Well, it depends what perspective. Explain. Well, Germany going into France by then. Definitely. France had already been conquered. Yeah. Britain would barely hold on. Very true. And what's happening to the rest of Europe? She's on a roll here. She's getting close. What's happening to the rest of Europe? Who's winning? Big time. They are winning big time. So if you were betting money at this point in time, bet on the Germans because you'd be winning lots of money, almost like winning the lottery. In fact, how bad is it if you're not on that side? Well, here's what's left. At this point in time, by the end of 1941, there are only two countries left trying to fight against Germany. All the rest in Europe have either been conquered, a few have joined as allies to Germany and Italy, and a few are left so-called neutral, but they're doing business actively with the Germans and hoping that the Germans don't change their mind and decide to invade them. That's the situation, and those two who are left, you mentioned one, who's, the, who's one of them? Yes, the United Kingdom, or Great Britain. What's their status? They've been bombed and battered, as you said. They're very nervous. They've been very much shaken. Winston Churchill is trying to rally the morale of the British people, and they're wondering, when are the Germans going to invade with forces? And what's the, who's the, all, the other country left fighting? Yeah, what we would call Russia today, then it was the bigger unit of the Soviet Union, Russia being part of it. What's their status at this point in time? Well, within six months and during the last half of 1941, German forces have overrun nearly all the European portion of the Soviet Union. They're within 20 miles of the capital of Moscow. The Soviet Union is ready to collapse. There's life in Europe. So if you're not on the side of the Germans, your life is about to change and is going to turn into a nightmare, including Holland, which is where I'm going to take you. Now, interesting enough, when the war broke out, we said September, start of September 39, the Dutch government said, we're going to be neutral. We don't want to be in this. And during World War I, 20 years earlier, they had declared neutrality and were left alone. Now, the Netherlands is not a big country. Take the state of Maryland, add a little bit more area to it. Today, there's over 16 million people. It's the most densely populated country in Europe. And at that point in time, about 9 million. Fairly densely populated then. And the little country to the south of it, Belgium, said, yeah, we're going to be neutral too. On the eastern border of those countries, a big country called Germany. Well, interesting enough, after the war broke out, 
Nothing happened. After the month, Poland falls. The British and French who said, all right, we're going to declare war against Germany, watch Poland go down and go, oh, sorry, didn't help a whole lot. And then nothing happens for about eight months. Spring 40, the war will now pick up and go full rage from that point on. And sorry, Holland, your neutrality, ah, patooey with that. May 10th, 1940, German forces invade the Netherlands. The Dutch, knowing that the neutrality likely would not be honored, were prepared. Troops were ready, and they put up a stiff fight. And they lasted, take a guess, how long? What's that? Five days, I don't know. Five days, we have a winner, yes, exactly five days, wow. Wow, normally, and we've had in some audiences people who actually were small children in the Netherlands at that time, just had one earlier this week, I was at a place, and she went, five days, before I even asked the question. She was there, she was like a child of seven, eight years old. They remember this very much. And what happens is the week is now starting to break on, the Dutch are actually putting up a stiff fight. The Germans don't like that, of course. And they turn to the government and say, if you keep fighting, we start bombing. And we're gonna go after one of your major cities, your commercial port, Rotterdam. So what do you wanna do? The prime minister, in consultation with his cabinet and the queen there, Queen Wilhelmina, go, you're right, we don't want this major destruction. We're gonna surrender. By the way, generals, you surrender now, we're leaving. They're gonna be a government in exile in London for the rest of the war. Good luck to you, Dutch people, and out they go. By the way, the Germans said afterwards, sorry, miscommunication, they bombed Rotterdam anyway. 30,000 people will die in that. And life in the Netherlands will begin to change because they will become an occupied country under Nazi Germany control. This is where Franz and Mien Weinacher live. And of all the different countries within Western Europe, this country, Netherlands, will suffer the most for a five year period of occupation. And each year of this occupation, life will get worse than the year before it. And right away the Germans put in charge one of their own men as a ruling governor. Like Hitler, an Austrian Nazi, a man named Arthur Seiss Inquart. And he'll surround himself with his own henchmen to run the country, in particular, another fellow Austrian Nazi named Hans Rauter. He'll be the one in charge of the security arm to keep control of the population, the SS as it was known as, a brutal henchman. And now life will start to change, but not right away. Initially, for the first few months of the summer of 1940, it seemed quiet, it seemed okay, the Germans even seemed nice. The Germans were hoping this, the Dutch, your kindred spirit to us. You're gonna be so excited we're here, you're gonna wanna join the empire with us. Eh, most of the Dutch said, no thanks. And things will start to change slowly. But by 1941, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. And this is what you're gonna see happen. Four areas of emphasis in terms of how the Germans ran this country, typical of many of the countries they occupied. One, control the flow of information. Well, in those days, unlike today, how did people get their major news? What, from what sources? Newspaper and radio, that's it, two sources. Television, we don't know what that is yet. The internet and all its many features, <laughs> who's ever thought of that one yet? Where's Al Gore? It doesn't happen. So that's not as hard to control, especially newspapers, because they're gonna start censoring the newspapers. One of the early underground and resistance efforts the Dutch do, underground newspapers, trying to get out the real news. The Germans want their propaganda to rule the day. Well, as the war goes on, the Germans don't like that they think the Dutch are listening to the radio because what you start getting on the radio broadcast is broadcast from London, the BBC. And even the Dutch government exile sets up its own radio station, Radio Orange. And the Queen starts to come on to give broadcast to try to rally the spirits of her Dutch people. Well, by fall of 1943, the Germans don't like that they think they'd already issued an edict earlier, don't listen to your radio. Try enforcing that one. They think some of the Dutch are listening to their radios and they're hearing these news because the situation in the war has started to change. By fall of 1943, the Germans are starting to suffer defeats. If you were betting money now, you're losing. They don't want the people to know that. And so Hans Rauter, the head of the SS, September 43, issues an edict across the country. All Dutch, turn in your radios. Nine million people, good luck trying to enforce that. He's even conducting raids in people's homes. I'm gonna get your radio. Now some Dutch, and if you know some people from the Netherlands who fit into this category of wry sense of humor, complied by doing this, turning in broken down, non-functional radios, but here, take my radio. Franz Weinacher, he's gonna keep his radio hidden. He didn't always follow the rules so well. In addition, as they're running this country, another area of emphasis was exploit all resources. Well, the Netherlands is fairly well developed economically. There's resources to be had. 
parts, machines, raw materials. The Germans are taking it, shipping it off to Germany. Take a guess, for what reason? Why do they want that stuff? That's right, supplying their war efforts. They never had enough of their own materials to do it. So they're taken from all the occupied countries, food as well. And in addition, as they're exploiting resources, the biggest resource to exploit, people. During the course of the war, 350,000 people from the Netherlands have to go work into Germany, what was referred to as forced labor. That's your job. And guess what that labor was being used for? That's right, building the war machine for the Germans, working the fields to get the food for the war machine. Germans never had enough of their own labor. They're able-bodied young men and women. What are they doing? What are they doing? They're in the military, or, by the way, there's two wars going on that people don't often realize. It's the Holocaust, which we now call later on the Holocaust. Well, they gotta have all this concentration camp stuff to run. That takes a lot of people. And then you've got the military side of it, too. So they don't have enough people, especially for the labor that they need, so they exploit from other countries. Well, the 350,000 people from the Netherlands who go into forced labor, 30,000 will not return home alive when the war is finally over. That's not a job assignment you want. Franz Weinacker, by the way, one of his challenges, he gets the notice that he's supposed to do this. If he does go, everything's gonna be doomed from what he's really trying to do. It's gonna be one of his obstacles he has to try to overcome. And in terms of exploiting resources people, I'll add one other example. The last six months of the war, when the Germans were starting to really lose, now it's starting in 1945, and I look at maybe a few younger gentlemen in here would fit into this category. They wanted you. What do they want, what do the Germans want you for? That's right, come join our army. By the way, it wasn't, we're recruiting, you know, we're, we're drafting. And so guess who goes into hiding in large numbers in the Netherlands in the last six months of the war? Young men, late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, boom, you better go and hide. Nobody wants to serve in the German army. That's basically a death wish. There's life in the Netherlands, not a pleasant place to be. In addition, a third area of emphasis in running this country Stamp out all resistance. The Germans did not like resistance of any form. Well, like our country today, if a country came in and conquered us tomorrow, we're not prepared to resist anyway. Neither were the Dutch. So slowly they start to do things on a small scale. A protest here, a strike there, a little underground newspaper here, and it starts to pick up steam. But the Germans react very harshly to those things. You want to organize a strike, you start doing it, we'll happy to move in forces and crush it and arrest everybody we can. And we don't care if we get them all right. We'll just throw them all in prison. And as it picks up, and the Dutch start to do the underground efforts of hit and run attacks, sabotage, espionage, many are getting caught. And they try to strike some of the Dutch helpers to the Germans, oh, the Germans don't like that. Mass arrest, sometimes executions. And if you strike against one of the German authorities, the reprisals were most brutal. For example, February 1943. One of the high-ranking Nazi officials stationed in the country was in The Hague, the capital, was a man named Hendrik Seifert. One night, his doorbell rings. He opens up the door, two Dutch resistance fighters shoot him dead. Hans Rauter, the head of the SS, hears about what happened. He rounds up 50 people and has them executed so the public can all know it and see it. And this is the beginning of a reign of terror that the Germans will do throughout the Netherlands through 43, 44, and 45 until the war finally is over. There's life. So if you want to get involved to try to help and resist, a lot of those people are trying to go into hiding once the Germans hear about them. It is not a safe place to be. And their last major priority in running this country was this. Persecute. Isolate. Round them up from around the country and put them into ghettos in the major city, Amsterdam, and then deport them on the trains to the death camps in Poland, the entire Jewish population of the Netherlands. Prior to the war, the Dutch Jewish population was approximately one and a half percent of the total. And things started to happen not all at once. But before 1940, the initial edicts would come out targeting Jews. For example, here's one of the early edicts. All Jews who work in prominent positions in university roles like professors or in government, civil service roles, you're out of a job because you're a Jew. Well, there weren't that many Dutch Jews in those roles at this point in time, but there were a few. The most prominent was a man named Lodovic Visser. His job was equivalent to what we have in our country today, the job of John Roberts. Civics lesson, what does John Roberts do in the United States? Yes, he's a Supreme Court justice. In fact, yes, the chief justice of the Supreme Court. That was basically Lodovic Visser's position. And he's out of a job now. 
before 1940 is over. And his fellow justices, in response, guess what they said? Correct. That's what they said. Nothing. And that was the green light for the Germans to go, we will continue this because the Dutch aren't going to say a whole lot or resist a whole lot to it. Let's go after the Jews. And it will continue throughout 1941. The edicts just keep coming out on a monthly, if not a weekly basis, that basically take the Jewish population and isolate them from the non-Jewish population. For employment, education, cultural and social life, you've now been removed. And now when you start going out into public, by May 1942, you have to wear this yellow badge that identifies you as a Jew. The public badge of humiliation. By July 1942, the trains are now working full blast. And the deportations are going and taking the Jews out of the country to the death camps in Poland. And it will continue for over a year until they can round up all they can grab. By the end of September 1943, they've grabbed as many as they can. So if you're in that group, the Jews, if you didn't figure out what's going on, you're doomed. And if you did, you tried to go into hiding, but will anybody help? That is what I'm going to talk about in a moment. It will be very challenging. Interesting enough, too, the Germans were masters of propaganda. And often the early people, they were deporting to the concentration camps and really the death camps like Auschwitz, Sobibor. When they would arrive, they'd often have to sign postcards, ready-made postcards. What did the postcards say? In essence, dear friends and family, life at the camp is not so bad. Yes, you have to work, but it's not so bad. We look forward to seeing you soon. So the people waiting would receive those postcards going, well, okay. Masters of propaganda to fool people what was really going to happen. There's life in the Netherlands. And by the way, if you want to be one of those people that says, I don't like what's going on, because I want to talk about what are the Dutch people doing about this, and you want to go help these Jewish friends or even acquaintances, try to help them hide. If you get caught, what happens to you? Take a guess. That's right. That's right. Or a trip to the concentration camp, free of charge. You go there too. So the consequence is going to be the same for you. So who wants to help the Jews? <laughs> In fact, let's talk about what's going on with the Dutch population as they're watching all this oppression and then persecution to their fellow Jews. Well, you can put those people into four groups. One group. I'll call them the fearful but sympathetic, meaning they feel really bad about what's going on. They don't like it, but they don't get involved because, say again? Well, it's not only not them, but back to, pardon me? It's too dangerous, I'm too afraid. That's why I say the fearful. Ah, sorry, so if you ring my doorbell, I feel bad for you, but I'm not opening my door. I can't help. And they're mixed in with this other group that I'll even say is larger number called the indifferent. And the indifferent, I don't care. I just want to survive this awful war and just keep my nose down. And I don't care about what's happening to anybody. I'm just trying to survive. And the indifferent, the Germans loved because they're actually helping the Germans. The Germans found for many of the Dutch were very much compliant. For example, you work in the railroad. You help keep the trains running. The Germans love it because that's where we get to ship out the materials we're taking from your country and ship out the Jews we're sending to the death camps. Thanks for your help. Just by doing their jobs. You work for the police. When we say, help us, we're gonna go on a raid. Okay, you follow orders, you go help round up people that are your own citizens. You work for the government. Oh, the Germans are big on record keeping. We need to identify who the population is, keep the records. You're just doing your job, helping keep records, especially who the Jews are. Thank you very much. You had a lot of that going on, the indifferent. Put the indifferent with the fearful and sympathetic, and you know what you have? 97% of the population, contrary to popular myth, there weren't a lot who were resisting this. In fact, the last two groups, small in number then, and I'll put it this way, you can all see that. One's a little bit more than the other. This one's the resistance and its various helpers. Franz and Mead Weinacher will be over here. But they're less than this group. This group is the collaborators and sympathizers with the Germans. In fact, what people often don't realize, Adolf Hitler had a lot of help in throughout Europe, not just in Germany. In every country, starting in the 30s, there was a widespread fascism and Nazi-like parties that were forming. The Dutch had it as well. Prior to the war, the Dutch had their own little Nazi party called the NSB by its initials. There were maybe about 5,000 people in it. Not a lot. And the Dutch, and much still true today, don't like extremists on the political left or the political right, so they pretty much looked at them as extremist idiots, ignore them. Well, within a year of the occupation, 100,000 people have now signed up for the NSB. Why? Why are they joining? What do you think?
Yes, they're betting on the Germans winning, and it's not so much for safety as for, because they want to be on the winning side, what do you get if you sign up and join the winning side to help them? Especially there's been a great depression going on as well. You get job opportunities. Loot, by, by the way, when they ship people out, there's all this loot they take. We get the good stuff, the Germans, but NSBers, we'll give you something for helping out. Opportunity, perks. In fact, in many cases, Arthur Sice in court, running this country, says, okay, department head in the government, you're not real happy with what I'm gonna do, that's okay, you can find something else to do. NSB or come in, take their job. Are you qualified? We don't care, you're with us. That's what counts. And there's other sympathizers with them who wanna cozy up to the Germans. As an example, one of the great sympathizers was the actual prime minister of the country when the Dutch get conquered. A man named Dirk Jan de Kerr. Now he goes off in exile with the government into London. But within five months, the queen says, sorry, you're out of that job, I'm getting a new prime minister. You go off on a diplomatic mission to Indonesia. He doesn't do that. And why does she remove him from the job? Because he keeps preaching, no, Netherlands, don't try to cozy up with the allied forces like Britain and the United States. Cozy up with the Germans, just cooperate with them. So he sneaks out when he's supposed to go to Indonesia and he comes back to the Netherlands and the Germans gladly take him because what is he gonna do? He publishes a pamphlet during the war. And that's what the pamphlet's saying. Cooperate with the Germans, get along, that's what will be the best for all of us. Wonderful sympathizer, a man of power here doing this kind of thing. And there were others obviously not in power who would always be, maybe not on NSB, but I'm happy to help tattle. And by the way, when the authorities are trying to find the Jews who didn't, they didn't grab the first time, who they think went into hiding. If you help find out that and report it to the authorities and they come and they get the person, bonus for you. Great way to make a little extra money. That's life in the Netherlands. Who's gonna help? Not a lot, because this last group, smaller number, various resistance groups. Takes time for many of them to organize. One of the problems the Dutch had with their resistance groups, about a half dozen eventually get organized. They weren't united. Good luck to you there. You're not strong enough together, let alone individually, to try to do much damage to the Germans and often are not very effective. Especially the hit and run, the espionage, often they're getting captured. Not working really well. Of all the resistance groups, one over time becomes quite effective. It was called the LO by its initials. Dutch term, Landelijke Organisatie. English translation, the National Organization for Helping People in Hiding. During the course of the war, by the way, this group was led by a woman too, very unusual for that time period. By mid-1943, they've really got a national network going and it's helping. And during the course of the war, they will help give false identity and hide 300,000 people from the Germans. But by the time they get involved and do any help, especially to the Jews who most need it, it's too late for many. At best, about 35,000 Jews will be able to get into hiding, but over a third will get caught because they're always on the most wanted list and a bonus to be had if you get them. That's life in the Netherlands. Franz and Mien Weimacher, I'll talk about them in a moment, they'll end up becoming helpers into this almost by accident. But before I talk about them, I want to tell you about something that makes them heroic. And then I'll be explaining why they got this special recognition. And I want to go back to the title of this book as I do so. Two Among the Righteous Few, A Story of Courage in the Holocaust. When this book was being produced last year by my publisher, Tate Publishing, out of the Oklahoma City area, the person whose job was to design the book cover called me and said, I want to understand the significance of this title, because then I can design a cover accordingly, and I think she did a great job. Well, I said, the key word in that title is the word righteous. And it comes from a place called Yad Vashem. Anybody ever heard of it? Yad Vashem? Ah, we got a few. Do you know what it is? Very good, Israeli Holocaust Museum, very good, in Jerusalem, Israel. Was started in 1953, the first of its kind. Today there's 100 plus around the world of various Holocaust education centers and museums. And over the years they've expanded it. I've been there twice myself and it's really quite large today, very moving, very educational. They get about a million visitors a year. Well there's a section within the museum called the Righteous Among the Nations. And in support of that, for the people who've gotten that very special honor, they have plaques and trees planted on the grounds all around the museum, and that's referred to as the Avenue of the Righteous. Well, who are these righteous? Who, what does this honor mean? Those are people, non-Jews, who during the course of the war and the Holocaust risked their lives to help save the lives of Jews, true heroes. And some of them lost their life trying to help. 
Among the most notable of the righteous among the nations, people are often aware of because of the movies. 1993, Academy Award winning movie. Very good, Schindler's List in honor of Oscar Schindler. He is one of the righteous, well deserved. Franz and Mean Weinacher are two Oscar Schindlers. They too will eventually get this honor. And it usually comes years after. For them it came late 1983 when Yad Vashem recognized their heroic acts. At that point in time, Mean the wife had already passed away. She dies in 1980. Franz is still living. So he's there to accept this special honor and he'll live all the way to 1994, almost the age of 86. Well, what did they do to earn this special honor? Well, let me focus in on that with you. In fact, when this war breaks out, they're just a young married couple. Franz at this point in time, just a little over age 30, means a few years younger, and they live in the southeastern portion of the Netherlands in an area of more small towns and villages, unlike the rest of the country that's more urbanized. And they're just trying to get through the war. And what's important in their life at this point in time is really three things. One, raise a family. By the end of 1942, they have four small children under the age of five trying to raise a family. Anybody, any parents in the room here? Can you imagine that? That's hard enough itself, and then you've got a war on top of it. That's their life, raise the kids. Want to be a good family here. And they played the traditional roles that was common in that time period. Meaning you run the household, Franz, you go work and support your family. He's a semi-skilled laborer, works at a grain mill, town over. Many people in that area, that's what they were, laborers, farmers, not a lot of high educated people in their area at this time period. And that's life, work hard, support your family, and finally, what's important to them, be good Catholics. Unlike today in Europe, and one might even argue the United States as well, then the role of the Catholic Church and Protestant faiths in other parts of the country were very dominant in many people's lives, especially in their area. In their area in particular, small town area, the local parish priest was a huge authority figure beyond just the walls of the church. And when he said, you do, you do. And when he said, you don't do, you don't do. And you make sure you go to church every Sunday and go to confession as well. And that's their life. Be good Catholics, raise your family, work hard. That's it, ordinary folk. Well, after the war broke out a short time later, Franz takes a leave of absence from his job at the mill. And he decides he can make a little bit more money by taking meat and eggs that he can get in the countryside here and travel on the train to the major cities, two hours to Amsterdam, two hours to The Hague, and sell the food to people there where food is in great need, especially good food like that. And he's starting to build up a little business. And he's a pretty good salesman, and it's going on for him, and it's not doing too badly. Spring, 1943. He's on one of these business calls one day. Whoops, got a question there? Pardon me? Basically, the question was whether the Nazis, Nazis, Catholics, or any particular religion, many individuals had religion, but as a practice, if you're part of the Nazi party, religion played no role in your life. Not at all. So let me go back to where I am in the story here. So Franz, spring 1943. As I said, he was on one of these business calls. He's in, the, in Amsterdam. And he's calling upon this doctor acquaintance he's done business with before. And as he's doing the business there, the doctor turns to him and says, would you be willing to help? You see, there's this young girl we have hiding here in the city right now. And we'd love to get her out to the countryside where the German presence is obviously much less. And you live somewhere in the countryside. What's the town? Dieden. Yeah, Dieden. OK. And maybe you take her for three weeks. she get a little fresh air, a little better food. Oh, by the way, she's Jewish. Would you be willing to help? The Franz went, OK. Not exactly knowing what he's getting into, but he's now starting into a new venture in his life. And before that day is over, he meets this girl. She's actually 14. But because of her small stature, he thinks she's 12. And he only knows her by her false Dutch identity name, Freitje. And by the time he gets home with Freitje on the train, it's almost midnight. No cell phones in that day. So he couldn't call me and say, hey, I'm going to be late tonight. So she's worried. But there he finally arrives. He says, hey, we've got this girl. We're going to keep her for three weeks. And Mean's reaction was, well, OK, let's get her to bed. The new business has just begun. Now, who's Freitje? Freitje was actually a German Jewish girl. She and her siblings are able to get out of Germany at the end of 1938. Someone mentioned Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht had happened a short time before, the massive rampage against the Jews in Germany. Life was taking a turn for a really worse. Dutch were willing to take in a few thousand what they called unaccompanied children. Children, not families. They'll never see their parents again. They'll get placed within Dutch Jewish homes within Amsterdam. And life for a couple years will go on. She's going to learn Dutch right away, go to school. Life's not so bad other than you don't have your parents. But she gets to see her siblings. 
and she gets to meet new friends. In fact, one of the friends that she had, among others, that just lived down the block from her, was a girl similar in age, who was also German-Jewish background as well, but her whole family were able to get out because they got out in the early 30s and made life in Amsterdam. That family will try to stay hiding in Amsterdam, where the German presence was the greatest. They don't get out. Luckily, Freitje does. This girl, by the way, her friend, I'm talking about, a girl named Anne Frank. Well, as you might guess, Freitje is going to stay longer than three weeks. In fact, within a short time after she's arrived, Ming goes to Franz one day and says, you know what? Freitje's Jewish. Did you know that? Yeah, I knew it. Well, she's been telling me she's got a younger brother also in hiding in Amsterdam. This is where he's located. Go get him! On the train, brings him home. Now there's two kids in their home. Two Jewish children on top of their four kids. But these two are refugees, and they're dangerous to have. The new business is starting to roll. In fact, a short time later, some acquaintances who had heard about this Franz Weinacher, these two older women, come on the train and deliver to him a 17-year-old girl and say, hey, would you take them in? And Franz and me go, yes, we'll take her. Now there's three children living in their house, three Jewish children who are basically refugees. The new business is starting to really pick up. And before long, a stranger shows up one day. Initially, Franz is a little suspicious because he's asking questions. He seems to know that he's got children in his home. How does he know this? He's from the LO. Remember that resistance organization that helps people in hiding? Likely that doctor acquaintance in Amsterdam was also part of the LO. And they've started to figure out whatever people we can help left, especially the Jews, who most of them have been caught, who are in the cities. If we can get them out countryside, better chance to keep them hidden. And so this gentleman goes by a code name, starts to explain this to Franz, and would you be willing to help? And Mean comes into the conversation. Yeah, there could be dangers in here. But we're trying to get the remaining Jews out first. Would you be willing to help find places for them in the area, take a few more in your house, whatever you can fit? And Franz and Mean look at each other and go, okay. Not exactly knowing what they're getting into, but this new business now is full blast. And now Franz will become a broker. As people are coming out, refugees, and he's helping them from all ages, children to adults to older adults. He's going around different acquaintances throughout the small town area and go, hey, would you take somebody in hiding? And often would tell the story, well, the war displaced people from their homes or it wasn't good, someone got sick, could you take them in? Because in many cases, didn't want to say, by the way, they're Jewish. Because more non-Jews were helping non-Jews hiding than helping Jews. Everyone he's helping were Jews. Total strangers to him. And that's what he would be doing. Seeing if he could get people, and by the way, we could pay you a little money for it too. And so he's getting people to help out one by one. And the challenges now start to pick up in this. And they certainly learn. Shortly after, both Franz and me, whoa, oh, this is dangerous and there are numerous challenges. For example, one of the most common ones you'd hear the term would be betrayed. Meaning, the person we have in our home, they've been exposed. We think people know about it. If the authorities come to get them, of course, Franz, they're going to come to get us. We're going to be doomed. We've been betrayed. Get them out of here. And there'd be the mad scramble, We've got to go find another place. Take him into our house temporarily. And he's dealing with this a lot. And there are numerous other challenges. When I reflect back on the challenges and dangers that they ended up having to deal with and face, I am stunned that they persisted. Because most people like us, we would have quit and ran fast. But they had the courage and compassion to continue. Let me tell you just one other challenge among many. It deals with the first adults they take into hiding in their own home. The first adult they took in was around the fall of 1943 was a gentleman named Lou. He's an architect by trade. He was already in hiding in Amsterdam. He was able to sneak out and come into the home of Franz and Mean. Luckily, his trade was very helpful because he will help design and build within the Weinacher home a hiding room. And by 1944, when the German presence starts to increase in their area, that's going to be very valuable to have. But Lou, similar in age to Franz, is not with his wife. She got out a little from Amsterdam a little bit later, short time afterwards, and unbeknownst to Franz, I mean, excuse me, unbeknownst to Lou, Franz actually placed her nearby. They often didn't want young married couples together. And his wife, Angeline, is at a place for about a month, and then she gets betrayed, gets sent out in the middle of the night and say, go find the home of Franz and Mean Weinacher, I think it's over here. And luckily she's able to find it without getting caught, and then has an emotional reunion with her husband, Lou. Great, and Franz and Mean say, well, welcome, we can keep you here. But a short time after arriving, Angeline says, I have a secret. I can't keep secret any longer. I'm pregnant. How are you going to have a baby under these conditions? This is not normal conditions. What are you going to do about that? In fact, one of the choices, send her away. This is just among many of the challenges. You can see where they get this award, Righteous Among the Nations, some years later. Because when this is finally over, and all these dangers are all around them, when liberation, almost after a nearly two-year effort, 
they will save the lives of at least two dozen Jews from certain death and nobody will get caught. You can see why they're true heroes. Now the last piece before I open up to more questions is I mentioned in the beginning I also have a very personal connection to this story. So I'm going to read you a little excerpt from the book to give you some insight into that. But let me set up the piece I'm about to read by first introducing my number one supporter on this special journey that I've been going on. Happens to be with me here today. It happens to be my wife, Leah Bars. Here she is. Yes, please. Well, my wife, Leah, and her family are actually immigrants from the Netherlands themselves. They moved to the United States when she was just shy of 14. They moved to LA. She takes to American television right away. Her mother will worried what's going to happen with her, but actually surprised her mother and goes on to UCLA and graduates from there. Then moves up here to the Bay Area, ends up having a wonderful career as a school psychologist, raises two adult daughters, young adult daughters today, and a little bit later in life picks me up. We've been married a little over five years now. Well, it's spring 2009, and she has not been back to her original homeland now for 25 years because life got in the way. And if you've ever lived somewhere else and you have those roots, that often has a very emotional pull. So she's been talking with me for a while, and I've never been. We need to do a special trip and go and spend some time there. Spring 2009, we go for a six-week trip traveling throughout the Netherlands. And along the way, we stumbled into something by accident that I thought was so significant that I end up writing a letter to her two daughters because I thought it would be important to know. That's the piece I'm going to read you about here. And one last thing before I do that. If you knew my wife Leah as a child in the Netherlands, you didn't know her by the name Leah so much. You knew her more by her Dutch nickname, Inika. So please keep that in mind as I read this piece. Chapter one, historic moment. Dear Shoshana and Alana, that's her two daughters. Today is Tuesday, May 26, 2009. I'm writing to share more than just travel stories from a wonderful journey your mom and I are having. I want to document something to you that I hope you will find of much value for your own family history. While I know some of the history, and you probably do too, coming in contact with the reality of it merges mind and heart into something of great significance. I will explain shortly. Being in the Netherlands, much more than in the United States, one is reminded of World War II and the Holocaust as well. When we started our trip in Amsterdam, we visited the Anne Frank House. It is a wonderful educational museum. Last Friday, we visited the museum and site of Camp Vesterbork. Before World War II, there were 140,000 Jews who lived in the Netherlands. 107,000 perished during the Holocaust. Vesterbork was the deportation center the Nazis used to ship the Dutch Jews off to the death camps in Poland. We arrived last evening in the city of Eindhoven in the south of the country. Of the places your mom's family lived prior to immigrating to the U.S., Eindhoven was where they were the longest. Before arriving there yesterday, we stopped in an old town named Robinstein. It is the big, small town in an area of villages in a southern section of the country. It is also near where your grandparents, Opa and Oma, were hidden during the war. As we stop and walk around the charming 1600s historic downtown of Robinstein, all two blocks of it, we spot a tourist information office. We go in, and your mom asks the staff members about the location of an old church in the nearby small town of Deden, and of the home that once belonged to a Franz Weinacher is still next to it. For the older folks in this area, which the three office people on hand were, the name of Franz Weinacher is a notable one. They tell your mom not only how to get to this church, but also that one of the Weinacher sons still lives in this particular house. So off we go down the road to Deden. About 10 minutes later, we find the church in question. We park our car at the old church and walk over to the house next door to it. The house has a long driveway. As we walk up the driveway, we see a few people sitting at a table in the front yard on this warm day, and we see the word Shalom written on the front side of the house, probably a foot in size. Your mom boldly walks up to the gentleman sitting there and says in Dutch, Hello, I'm in a kabars. A roar goes up along with a warm handshake. This man and his wife sitting with him know who Inika Bars is and much more of the significance related to her. In the next few minutes, the Dutch starts flying and phone calls start happening. Within 10 minutes, his youngest sibling, Irene, drives over and joins in this lively discussion. The man who has greeted us is Franz Weinacher, Jr. He is the youngest son of the aforementioned Franz Weinacher. His father, Franz, with the support of his mother, Mien, saved your grandparents and your mom, baby Inika, during World War II. 
They all survived the Holocaust because this Catholic man and his wife hid them and other Jews and helped even more hide from the Nazis. Do you recognize the significance of this moment? Franz the son and his wife, also named Irene, visited Israel themselves last year. They showed us a blown up picture of the memorial plaque and tree planted in Yad Vashem's Avenue of the Righteous section in honor of their parents, which is when the historic significance of what I was witnessing really hit me. After visiting for over an hour, They've invited us to come back Wednesday evening. They have three other siblings who are all alive and live in the local area. So your mom will likely meet more of the Weinacher family who she has not seen in 25 years. I'll open up the floor to your questions, comments. So I just have a question, like um, in your storytelling, like uh, it seems like a quite easy decision for those couple to just help those Jewish people. But I guess like, you know, under such a situation, it's quite dangerous. It's actually yes. a huge decision to make to help them. So what do you think is the force or like the motivation to uh, make this couple to make the decision to help so many Jewish people? Yes, great question here. And, it's, and as you can hear as I told it, and you, and you would get the same thing as you read this more in depth, is they stumble into this by accident. But there was this thinking that Franz had, and mean definitely along with him, that said, people are asking for help. That's a Dutch thing to do, you help. Now that wasn't a Dutch thing to do, as we find out. But there was just that thing of people are asking for help, and we even heard years later, as we now know the family, the siblings, that he always kind of wanted to make a difference in his life in some way, and so it was kind of like this. But it's almost they stumble into it, and they don't realize it at first. And along the way, they get scared even and almost back away, but then they don't. And they'll continue, but they definitely get challenged. But there's, there's a moral fiber and character that you can see come out that, you know, you don't always know the why, you have to draw your own conclusions, but at least it came through. Thank God it did. Great question, thank you. What is your name? Rachel. Rachel. Uh, so what happened when you came back from that visit with the family that Wednesday? All right, great question, Rachel. Thank, thank you very you. much, great question. As a matter, as you finish reading here, it's, you know, it's a Monday. We stumbled in this area by accident. The Weinacher family know who Inika Bars is. Now, this is Inika Bars right here, folks. And so they started just talking to their other siblings and who can come, and you can imagine that. Somebody you have not seen in 25 years shows up, you get a call from maybe a, a sister or brother and says, hey, can you come over tomorrow night? Most of us would say, all right, I'm busy, I got this going, I got, you know, sorry, you know, give them my regards. Because they heard Inika Bars was in town, all five siblings come bringing their spouses with them. They're excited to see her. The last time she had been there, I said it had been 25 years, it was the summer of 1984. She traveled from San Francisco with then her oldest daughter who was five to go visit Franz Weinacher who was still alive because the local area had heard about this special honor he gets from Yad Vashem, righteous among the nations, so they throw a parade for him to say, here's really a local hero. Now they recognize that. And who's in the parade? In a Kabars. But then as the years go by, life got in the way. So this has been kind of a happy reunion, and we are still in touch with the family today, which has been a nice part of this journey. So thank you for your question. How do we, uh, how do we take the lessons we learned from the dark period and apply it to the world today? Yeah, good question, good question. Let me throw it back to all of you. You know, what lessons can you take? How can you apply it to your life today? Then you know, from this story, it's a great question. Let me hear a few of your thoughts, and then I can offer a thought as well. I think, uh, I think all stakeholders, like the governments and other entities, should take minority suppression very seriously. Uh -huh. So whenever any country moves towards minority suppression, or uh, sort of at least has tendencies towards that, I think countries should react very forcefully to uh, arrest that trend. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a lesson, because that can actually get bigger and much worse if you leave it uh, Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. In essence, too, and I've often had people, to your great question here, speak up going, do I have that courage to speak out when I see something going wrong? Discrimination, oppression. Because those things are happening. Sometimes we don't notice them. It's easy to get caught up in our good life and not see it. But that's one of the lessons people often comment is, can I speak out? Whether our government will do anything or not, can at least I speak out and say something and try to help? Definitely is a great lesson you can take away from this story. Others, other thoughts on that? Let me throw one to you, then I want you to comment. One of the things, and this has been the neat part of, I've talked about this in a variety of venues as I've shared this story, but in workplaces in particular, what I'm being asked to often emphasize, this story is a story of ethics. 
How is this a story of ethics? What are ethics? What do you think? It's a sense of doing the right thing. Uh-huh. I think you can take that in your life every day. How do you treat people? And you get sometimes challenges in life, and you could get away with doing it this way. Is that the right thing? I think most people, in my experiences, they know deep in what's right and what's not. These people not only were able to do that, they did it with their life at risk. How many of us are willing to do that? We don't usually have that pressure, thank goodness. But can we treat, know right from wrong? And for those of you who are parents in the room, are you teaching that to your children? Those are definitely stories. I think well, one of the neat things is we've gotten reacquainted and me acquainted with the Weinacher family. You can see with all five of the siblings, there is a moral character. You know their parents passed it on to them. They think it's important to care about other people. One of the messages from the story, can you care about people beyond yourself? Just in doing your job, team members you work with. If you can, you're gonna be a valuable team member, let alone a parent, person in the community. There's all those opportunities. Great question, thank you for that. Let me take a couple more here before we will wrap up. Got one, please. Can I ask one more? So I remember you mentioned like uh, three things about the couples. Yeah. So one is like the uh, just ordinary sub, uh, suburban couples and they yeah. have uh, four children. And you also emphasize they are Catholic. Yeah. So do you think this is uh, very important, like the uh, Catholic or Christian, like their religion really helped them to make such a decision to really help uh, people? Good question. All right. It's one of those things I'd say read more about it and let you draw your own conclusions. So I'll answer it briefly. And I'd say that my answer is yes and no. The religion was important to them and, and it may have played a role in what they did. But in the reality of living their lives, if they'd been following the religious leadership they had, they would not have been involved. The religious leadership, the clergy, weren't always setting the examples. One could argue that's maybe still the case today sometimes. It, it varies, of course. One of the biggest thorns for Franz in this secret work that he's doing, trying to help save the lives of people, was his local parish priest. And it was different throughout the country. Some were helpful, some weren't. Some could care less, you don't bother, and others would say, I'll, I'll get involved. And in the Netherlands, they'll lose over 90 Protestant and Catholic clergy who will get executed or die in the concentration camps because they do speak up, and many won't. He had the thorn in this case. So it's a mixed bag. You know, who's going to help, who's not, is their religion driving them? And I think if you look more, just as you draw conclusions, there was a moral character, whether it came from their Catholicism or not, it was there. And if the Catholicism was not supporting it, they would have the moral character to go, then we're going to still do the right thing. The ethics comes through the most. Great question. Let's make sure we get uh, another question answered, right? Yeah, we always want to make sure this one here. And Nadine, can you come on up here for a moment? We always want to make sure people get this one. <laughs> so, uh, whatever happened with that baby? Ah, good <laughs> question. Good question. Remember that challenge I mentioned, the baby? You know, the, you know, the woman is pregnant there? Uh-huh. Anyone want to answer that? What happens? Say again? What, say again? Uh, no, 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 it was real. It was real. <laughs> And she was about five months along. You can't hide that anymore. It wasn't just a pillow in there. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, I think you were starting to figure it out. We are with the baby today. It looks just the same. Yes. Oh. yes. How do you know that? Have you seen the pictures? You've seen the pictures. Yeah, yes. I said I have a meaningful personal connection to the story. I brought her with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, here, Paul. This is fine. One of the things here, and I only knew about this in terms of I knew her, her origins. I didn't know the specifics behind it, and she's learned a lot in terms of all that went, went on there, not just for herself. Well, chapter nine is the short answer to the question. But this is one of their biggest dilemmas, because if you think about how you can have a baby under these circumstances, you can't go to the hospital. Uh, good luck trying to find a doctor, because most doctors are gonna run from this. They don't want the authorities to know what they're doing. It's too dangerous to touch a Jewish mother. And so, Franz and Mean have to deal with this, and I'll just give you a little insight, because they will decide that they will try to help. They, they have that, remember that first couple they take into hiding, Lou and Angeline? Well, that's her parents. And they agree with them, this is the strategy. However we get this pregnancy done, you know, to get the birth done, because we don't know how yet, we're gonna register her as our own child with the authorities. So we could keep her with our children. In the event of danger comes, authorities show up, we just, this is just one of our children, and we can keep her outside. That's pretty courageous. 
they will perform a miracle. And I get to enjoy the miracle every day. I say thank God for the courage and compassion of Franz and Mungaila. Thank you all. A great audience, thank you so much. <laughs>